Here's another podcast that you must listen to right now. Built to Last is a podcast by American Express that highlights the stories, history, and continued legacy of Black-owned small businesses that shape American culture. In honor of Black History Month, American Express is continuing to shine a light on these Black-owned businesses with the release of a special episode highlighting Rose Nico, the first known coffee vendor in New Orleans in the 1800s, and Sip and Sonder, a community and well-being focused coffee shop in Inglewood, California. If you haven't already, check out the debut season of Built to Last and see host Elaine Welteroff explore how the Black business leaders of our past have inspired today's Black-owned small businesses. Check out the debut season of Built to Last on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your favorite podcast. You know, I believe there's nothing better for the soul or your imagination than an inventive, thoughtful, surprising short story. And funnily enough, I read one aloud every week on LeVar Burton Reads. Season 8 is out now, and as always, it's me, LeVar Burton, reading my favorite short fiction aloud with soundscapes and music. Listen in Stitcher, Apple, the SiriusXM app, or wherever you get your podcasts on. Becoming a self-made millionaire. Every sector of our lives is pretty much pretty much under construction. Family under construction. Career under construction. Relationships under construction. Emotions. I know mine live under construction. Finances under construction. We might as well be under, under construction, construction together. together. Welcome to Under Construction with your girl Tamar Braxton. Look, y'all, I know we're halfway through the month, but happy Black History Month. You know, I feel like this year, Black History Month is so special since we have our first African-American woman as vice president. Don't y'all feel the same way? I know I do. Are y'all doing anything special to celebrate this month? Well, since I'm in a school teaching mood, I'm just going to incorporate some African-American leaders, some special Black History games into Logan's school schedule. So hopefully he'll enjoy that because that was one of my favorite things to do during Black History Month is to learn about my people. How about that? All right, so earlier this month, we launched our Walk It Like I Talk It Challenge. And I am loving all of the pictures and videos that have been coming in. And it's been great watching everyone get their exercise in while enjoying under construction. Yeah, baby. Okay, so for those who haven't sent in their footage, let me tell you about the challenge. Okay, so in effort to support good heart health, I'm inviting you to please join me in our Walk It Like I Talk It Challenge. All you have to do is send me pictures and videos of you listening to under construction while walking it out. See, isn't that simple? Yeah, simple. You can do it. Just post your pic or video to IG and tag your girl at UC with Tamar or email it to UC with Tamar at gmail.com. That's the letters UC with Tamar at gmail.com. All right. Now that we've got our physical health in order, let's get our mental health in check. OK, let's do this week's affirmation. Y'all ready? Because this one is simple, huh? but it's powerful. Y'all ready? Because she ready. I believe I can do anything. <laughs> Let the church say who? <laughs> A to the men. This affirmation doesn't just say I can do anything if my man say I can or my friends think I can. Y'all, it says I, me, she, he, him, her can do anything. Period. How about that? So take accountability of who you are and what you want for your life. How about that? Can't nobody stop you but you. Come on, say it with me. I believe I can do anything. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If that didn't bless you, I don't know. You might be too far gone because that thing blessed me. All right, so this week on Tamar Takes, we're tackling at-home decorating. Now, most people don't know how much I love decorating. So today, I'm going to be sharing a few tips to help you with some fun and cost-effective enhancements to keep your home comfy and popping, okay? All right, so this is one of my favorite things. And a lot of people think it's overly expensive to accessorize. Now, I think it's not really about the cost. It's about how much you accessorize. Most of y'all think y'all got to buy a knickknack for every nook and cranny of the room. No, it don't work like that, okay? You look like a yard sale. That ain't it. 
I would suggest, depending on how big your room is, you know, two to four pictures or mirrors on the wall at max. Okay. Two pillows per chair or, you know, like small comfy couch, you know, a table. You can put a flower and one knickknack, not seven. Or you can put like seven to 10 picture frames that you can go to Michael's or you can go to a thrift shop and get for like a dollar or two or three. And you can do your whole accessory for one room for under 30 bucks, guys. You know, go online. Go to your, I know a lot of people, I ain't going to that Goodwill. I ain't going to Home Goods. I, no, these places are your friends. Okay, you'd be surprised about the sales and clearance rack from the Holy Ghost. Okay? And one thing I do believe in is wallpaper. Y'all, I'm obsessed with wallpaper. I love it. I just think, you know, you don't have to wallpaper your whole room like I have from top to bottom. But you can at least do an accent wall and it will give you the pop you need on your budget. All right. So those are just some of my design suggestions. And y'all know I love style and fashion. So if you like my style on the red carpet, then you might just want to try some of my at home style suggestions as well. OK, as you know, take what works for you and forget the rest. But this is Tamar Takes. All right, I'm finna keep it a thou thou. Hey, man, it is all me. All right, y'all, it's time to tap into that keep it a thou thou inbox and pull out a few questions for your girl. Let's see what we got today. Question number one. Hey, Tamar, I think I'm in love with my homegirl. We've been friends since high school. We lost all communication after she moved to Gary, Indiana, but we recently reconnected about a year and a half ago. Since then, I've been feeling a feeling that I've never felt before. I get butterflies when we talk, and she has two beautiful baby girls. She's a single mom. What should I do? Okay, let me tell you, because this is a little touchy, you know. When my homeboys in the past started liking me, I started to feel betrayed. <laughs> Like, how long you been having these feelings? I've been pouring my heart out, getting advice, talking about things that you usually won't talk to somebody that you like or could date. You know what I'm saying? About. And all this time you've been liking me. Betrayal. No. Okay. You have to find out if that person feels that same way about you first. You might can throw out, you know, some signs or some hints. You know what I'm saying? Like, if they be like, oh, my God, I hate being single. Dating is not cool. You know, you'd be like, you know what? How about me and you sh should go out on a date? Let me take you out once a week and show you how somebody need to treat you and some shit like that. And if they say, no, you're like my brother. I don't want to Then you know that they ain't reciprocating and keep them feelings to yourself. <laughs> That's what I got for you. But don't be around here betraying people, trusting feelings because she think y'all friends. OK, don't do that. You got to be slick about how you express your feelings because it could blow up in your face and you don't lost your crush and your homegirl. And that ain't it. OK, question number two. Hey, Tamar, my question is this. It seems like you have an amazing story to share. Would you ever consider doing a biopic about your life? Um, I think that I'm just basically starting out, but with all that I have been through, absolutely. I, I would do a short, quick 45 minute biopic <laughs> of my life because I feel like I have so much farther to go. And a lot of the things that has already happened in my life, I've already discussed, but it could be a book in the future. Look at God. All right. Well, I hope y'all are enjoying the advice that I'm sharing. Y'all know I love to give my thoughts and opinions about things. So keep it a thou thou allows me to do just that. If you'd like to have your questions answered during an upcoming episode of Under Construction, shoot your girl a no to UC with Tamar at gmail.com. That's the letters UC with Tamar at gmail.com. Look, I don't have all the answers, but you can count on me to always keep it a thou thou. Well, up next is my favorite part of the show. We're going into the blueprint. This, this is the blueprint. Come on, y'all. Let's go. Okay, so did you know that the first known use of the word self-made was back in 1555, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which defines the phrase as having achieved success or prominence by one's own efforts? 
Well, today I'm excited to introduce you to my dear friend, Todrick Hall. You might remember him from his performances on season nine of American Idol, where he made it all the way to the semifinals before being cut. Now to viewers, it looked like he lost, but unbeknownst to us, it was the perfect springboard for his career. His story is such a beautiful example of the quote, all things are always working together for your good. Now, as you listen to his story, I want you to seriously sit back and think about the challenges you faced. And by the end of our conversation, I'm going to ask you what challenges are keeping you from being a self-made millionaire. Now, Tajik has literally gone on to being the captain of his own ship and isn't turning back for nothing. Listen, everybody, I'm honored, excited and ready to learn from this magnificent soul Welcome to Under Construction, my dear friend, Todrick Hall. Let's start from the um, rooter to the tutor, okay? okay? How did you end up at American Idol? Oh, well, uh, okay, so I was a huge American Idol fan, and not just a fan, like I was one of those people who was a faithful person that, that called in and voted for everybody that I loved, and that's yeah. from from the first season when I loved R.J. Hilton. I wanted to marry him. I was obsessed with him, and then he was my first pick, even though I knew Kelly Clarkson because we both worked at Six Flags over Texas, so I think I was just obsessed with that show. Anyway. Um, Wait, what? You just going to skip over that? Yeah, we, yeah, we both worked at Six Flags over Texas. Isn't that crazy? Before she was ever famous, and she was so in the you Southern knew Kelly Palace. Before American Idol, I didn't know her as well as other people that were in her show because she worked in a different theater than I worked in. Mm. But the guy that I ended up dating, Brad, was her um, was her dance partner uh, at the Main Gate show. So we'd do our own shows, and at the end of the night, we'd come together and do a show. So I remember watching her. And voting for her so many times after my future husband, R.J. Hilton, was kicked off the show. And then uh, I remember listening to her sing A Moment Like This, and I was crying, like, real tears. Like, Mufasa just died tears when she was yeah. when she <laughs> won because it felt so close to home. And um, anyway, so I was always such a huge fan of the show, but my dream was to be on Broadway. Like, I was always a theater nerd, but I loved Oprah Winfrey, and I loved the Oprah show. And so when I, I was doing a cruise ship, and my mom would record all the Oprah episodes and she'd send them to me every week. And I was watching Oprah and I saw that Fantasia was going to be on Broadway in the color purple. And I watched it and I was like, oh my God, I, I would die to see this. And I ended up through a long series of events having to get off of the cruise ship. And I quit because I found out that there was an audition for the color purple and they were looking for one male dancer. Long story short, I went and auditioned for the show. I got it. And I did my Broadway debut and I had lines, like six lines with Fantasia. I'd never met her before. I'd never spoken to a celebrity before in my life. And <laughs> it was just like absolutely insane to be like performing with her. And I remember like we didn't get to rehearse with her because she was the star of the show. Like, and I was just an ensemble member. And so on the day that we got ready to do our scene, she came around the corner and she looked at me and she was like, you got this like from across the stage. And we did our little scene together. But that was a long winded explanation to say that like seeing how American Idol changed her life firsthand from being in the show with her and from being one of the people who voted for her. I was like, that's a show that I want to be on. So I went and auditioned and then I ended up making it pretty far on the show. But that was she was the reason why I auditioned. So you were already on Broadway. Yeah. And then you went to American Idol. Yeah. Wow. I was a dancer on Broadway. That. Yeah, it was crazy. I, I uh, got Broadway when I was 20 years old, so I was a baby. You know, one would think that you wouldn't need American Idol after Broadway. Broadway is like you made it. You know what I'm saying? What more were you looking for? I think that I've always been so insecure about singing because my voice has been so raspy and stuff. And and I, I think that so much of singing is confidence. And for mm -hmm. me... Like I didn't have the confidence to go up and sing in front of people. I was mortified to go do that. And so I was like, everybody would also, when I worked at Six Flags, be like, oh, he can sing. But I would get like the little songs that would have like four lines in them. And um, they would always say he can sing, but he's really a dancer. And so I just wanted to take myself out of that box because I felt like I could sing better than somebody that just was a dancer who could kind of sing. Right, so right. for me, it was more about proving to myself if I went to a place and auditioned against hundreds of thousands of people and got through for singing, then that would make the world look at me as a singer. So it was more me trying to prove it to myself and prove to the world. Because being a dancer on Broadway is a, is a really, really awesome gig and it's really prestigious and it's hard to yeah. get there. But 
you're not going to get rich off of being on Broadway. You're doing <clears> eight <throat> shows a week, dancing, yeah. singing, lifting people up. I had to do a round off two back handsprings into a layout eight <laughs> shows a week on a raked stage and lift up bitches, having them singing with a crotch <laughs> on my shoulder. I was not, it, it was hard work. And that is such a short lived lifespan to be a performer. Yeah. And, and, and you can't do that for forever. And I already knew that. So I was like, I got to start planning for my future. Also, it was my dream to be on Broadway. And when you get something like that at 20, then you're like, well, I got to aim higher. I got to get bigger dreams. Yeah. So um, I knew that I wanted to just every little thing that has been in my life, because I haven't had like great examples of people that did those things that looked like me. There was no Billy Porter. There was no RuPaul right then at that right. moment, even though RuPaul had had their show and stuff but like there was no like example of what I could be as a gay black man from Texas and so I just did these like little inchworm advancements in my career I would always say like well now I want to try to just let people know I can sing and I want to get a lead in a Broadway show someday and like I never was like I want to be famous I want to be a star that was not a thought that ever crossed my mind or something I wanted to chase it was just I want to see if I can get past the first round because I didn't even know anyone other than Kelly Clarkson who had made it that's the first round of American Idol. You know, you mentioned something that really just stood out to me. You was like, you were a young gay black man in Texas. Tell me what mm -hmm. that was like growing up. Was that difficult? It was really difficult because I don't think that people who are not gay and who aren't really close with people who are gay realize what it's like just to be a gay man, but especially in a culture that is so based on religion and where being masculine is such a requirement for a man to be. There are certain things that when I'm with my white friends, like they can wear like flip flops and they can wear pink shirts from Abercrombie and Fitch or whatever growing up. But that was something that was like, it was a rule. Like it was, there's so many like different rules and guidelines. You can't have this ear pierced because that means you're gay. And like all these yes. dumb things that now looking back on it, I'm like, why would I even like subscribe to that type of mentality? But when right. you live in a world where it's surrounded by that, you want to prove that you're not this. And, and there's so many toxic things that are associated with being gay and people say that they are disease ridden and STD ridden and um, that they are pedophiles and that they're going to go to hell. And, you know, like, it's just, there's so many negative connotations associated with it. So when you start to even question in your mind that you might be that, it's really scary. And I was always a little bit softer than all the other boys <laughs> in my family. It was, it was really, 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 really hard. And it was the scariest thing I ever did to tell my mom that I was gay. Like, even to this day, I've, I've experienced a lot of scary things, but to sit your mom down and tell them that you're gay is, is, is a, a black mom in 2001. In Texas. That's a, in Texas. A black mom that I, I've never heard my mom say a cuss word ever. I've, my mom doesn't drink. My mom is just like a Christian. She's not one of those people <laughs> that be acting at church. Like she, she, she is that person. She truly believes everything that Bible says. And, and that's what she like bases her life on. It was really hard. It was very, very difficult. I'm sure it was difficult. And so I'm going to ask you another difficult question. And let me know if I'm like prying a little bit too deep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe one of our or some of our listeners don't know how to sit their Bible Belt Southern parents down and have that conversation, especially our African American yeah. brothers. How did you have that conversation with your mother and what made you do that that day? I think that um, my mom was my best friend at that point. I wasn't close to my dad at all. And so I just I for some reason, I knew that my mom, it wasn't ideal for her. But honestly, I think I was oblivious to how big of a deal it would be to her. So I sat her down and I just talked to her about it. But even though my mom is very close minded in a lot of ways, and she's working on it, and she's come a long way since I told her that. But my mom still is a lot more accepting and understanding than a lot of people. And I used to get online and be like, come out, come out, live your truth, you'll be happy you did. But the reality is, for some people, it's not safe to come out. It's not right. safe. They aren't in a place where they can take <laughs> care of themselves where they feel like they're in a safe space and luckily my mom is a type of mom who has like the undying love for a child that she would never have disowned me or kicked me out of the house but I've gone to so many homeless shelters like LGBTQ specific homeless shelters yeah where so many kids that were my age come out or they they don't even come out, their parents see an email or something on social media and they kick them out, disown them, don't speak to them, beat them up, kill them. You see these horror stories online. So I know that's not what you asked me, but like I would say <laughs> before I even okay. say this, like for some people, it, 
I wouldn't, I don't now suggest people to come out unless they feel ready and they feel like they're, they have yeah. the type of parents that would not harm them or put their life and in, in their future in jeopardy to come out. But I think you just got to be honest and you got to hope and pray that your parents are the type of parents that are going to love you unconditionally because people love to say they're Christian until their kid comes yeah. out and is doing something that they don't agree with. And then all of a sudden those Christian morals and values and all the things they sing about like go out the window. And so it's two words words that you got to say. And it's so difficult. It's like you're trying to erupt from your body and like tell somebody something. And it's crazy that those words are so powerful and they can be such a huge like handicap for people, like hand invisible handcuffs on their, on their life because they don't feel like they can fully spread their wings because they're trying to like hold this back. But once you say those words, you've given all that power away. And I've never had a baby, but I feel like it's the closest thing that I will ever be ex- able to experience about what yeah. that's like to release that, to be able to just say it, even though it was so scary, it felt like the weight of the world was like off me. And I felt like at that moment, I was like reborn. And like, that's when my life restarted. You said there were two words. Those two words is what? I'm gay? Yeah. I can imagine that being the hardest words that would come out of, you know, someone's mouth, especially when you don't know how the other person is going to receive that. It's almost like saying, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It's like saying those words is super hard because you have to be real and honest with yourself. How and much not to you- diminish anybody's struggle, but I think a lot yeah. of people would rather their kids say, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a then murderer, I'm, gay, I'm a drug right? dealer, I'm going to jail, then yeah. I'm gay. Yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. Do you think that the acceptance of your mom when you told her, when you came out to her, was helpful to your self-esteem when you went to Broadway? Well, I don't feel like my mom really accepted it. That's the thing. I don't think if I painted that picture very clear. My mom did not accept it. She was just more accepting than other people that I had heard before. Um, My mom couldn't even say the words, my child is gay, for maybe 10, 15 years after I told her that I was gay. She would find other ways to like dance around it. She couldn't say those words, I have a gay son or my child is gay for a very, very long time. But it still made me feel free because she knew and I didn't have to hide about it. I didn't have to hope and pray she wasn't going to, you feel like you're hiding a dead body in your house. Like you don't want them to excellently see something or hear a phone call. Because back then we were on a landline and we were using that dial up internet. And like sometimes, (laughs) you know, growing up gay, like, there was no, there was no the prom or like pose or call me by your name, moonlight, yeah. any of those things. Like when you typed in gay, you're going to see a bunch of booty holes on your, on your computer, you know, <laughs> and they would pop up and pop up and pop up. You'd be, I cannot tell you how many like close calls I had in high school trying to close out all these damn windows and this dial up internet. <laughs> Jesus. Because I didn't want my parents to find out. I mean, it was crazy. So like, But that's how you learned how to be gay. That's what you thought gay was. Because when you typed in gay, it was porn. That was it. There was no love stories. There was nothing to explain to you. There's no handbook to like help you know what it's like. You know, a lot of straight people, you see movies your whole life that show you an example. And usually your parents are an example of what life could be like and what it's supposed to look like by society standards. And we didn't ever have that. So my mom was, she tolerated it. And she didn't yeah. kick me out and she loved me the best way she knew how to love me, but she did not accept it. Okay. So, you know, to be honest, one of the things that I love about you is that you've always made it clear that you aspire to be a role model for the LBGTQ community and mm-hmm. people of color. Why is that so important to you? I didn't really feel that way until I went on tour for the first time. And when you're on social media and you're just like, your head is like down and you're making all these videos, you don't realize the impact it's having on people. And even though there are comments there, after a few million views and stuff, you start to be like, okay, these are just like, they they don't seem real to you. But the first time you go on tour and you actually see these people that have been changed and affected by your life and people telling you that your song saved their life and made them not commit suicide and that they're you're the reason that they they came out I mean such a huge chapter of my life now I'm inspiring other people to do that because Mm -hmm. of the work I'm putting out like that's a, an, a, an amount of pressure that is not normal for a human to take on, but also it was the most rewarding thing in the world because up until then, I think I had been doing all the work for like very surface level reasons to get followers and to be famous and to hopefully get a verified check. I remember when I got that verified check, honey, I was like, bitch, 
you can't tell me shit. I got a verified check. I mean, that meant so much to me at that moment. And I don't know, I've, I've recently been questioning those things. Like, why does that mean so much to us? And I think for me personally, it was because so many people said I couldn't do anything. And so I've been bullied for so many years and called gay and faggot and gay wad and like my whole life growing up. And for me to be able to do something that was like where the world was recognizing, like, this is a not a regular person. This is somebody who has achieved something that's extraordinary or, or superior to what a lot of other people would accomplish. It was like a verification that I needed for myself. And so I didn't need it, but I thought I needed it at that time. Yeah, I just was like hustling out here, doing everything I could do to make a name for myself because I did not want to go back to Texas with my tail between <laughs> my legs. I didn't want to go back yeah. and be in the ensemble of another Broadway show, which I did. I went back and I did Memphis as my second Broadway musical. And I, it, while it was an all right experience, it just... It, I knew that I wasn't meant to be in a dressing room with those people at that time. Like I realized that I had had a taste of a life and that I knew that I was capable of doing more than that. I'm not trying to downplay ensemble members because I love being in the ensemble, but I think that the world, like people would show up to the show and want to meet me at the stage door. And I was just an ensemble member. And I felt like the universe was letting me know, like you have something really great and specific that you should offer. And this is just not it. And so I quit that show And I came to LA when it was not a thing for people to just be doing YouTube full time. And I just bet everything I had on myself and ate McDonald's and ramen noodles nonstop (laughs) and struggled and was broke and stressed, got my car repossessed, had to take the train, was having to sneak on buses and like do everything I could do to survive in LA because I was not going to go home. That's amazing. So you purposely created your own lane. Is that what you're saying? Do you think that this was intentional, this lane right here? I don't know if it was intentional, but I realized that I was creating and carving out the lane because when I first got here, I got an agent um, Mm -hmm. really quickly, actually. Thank you. Shout out to Savage Agency, the first people to sign me when nobody knew who I was and didn't really care. But they, um, they signed me and I started going to auditions, but I just realized that the amount of auditions that I had for people like me was so small that if I relied on that to be able to perform and to be able to get my, I wouldn't, would not get anywhere. So I knew that like people weren't knocking down my door to represent an openly gay black man. Like that was not like at the top tier of things that people were trying to do. No one was having conversations about diversity and uh, representation the way they are now. So I was like, if you want to survive, you got to figure this out on your own and let them catch up later and then build a name for yourself. And you can't release these songs that no one's going to be able to to find. You got to find a way, a niche market for you to like take and be the one person that's known for that on the internet. So I knew I had to do it, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. I started singing in drive throughs at McDonald's and then I was doing a Target flash mob. And every now and then I would get to a point where I was like, Maybe this isn't going to work. And then my phone would blow up and Beyonce would make a video to me saying Todrick called thanks and posting it on online. And it was like these little like glimpses of hope that I kept getting being like, okay, you can make it. You live yeah. to see another month. And I would just do anything for any amount of money. You need me to dance at a bar mitzvah, I'm there. You need me to <laughs> sing some songs at somebody's wedding, I'm there. But it's like, I will do whatever I have to do. I was like, picking up cans or recycling them, like any little piece of money I could get to survive, I was doing. You know, I asked you that because I don't think I was intentional. It just happened. You know, when I was on the Braxton's, it was just really about me being the youngest of five sisters who always gave her unsolicited advice and who (laughs) knew that she just wanted to be a singer. You know what I'm saying? And I had no idea that, the things that I would say would be, you know, a part of pop culture. And then, you know, people really did take me seriously as a singer, although I already in my mind was Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> I had already arrived. I was waiting for everybody else to show up to the party. Yeah. Right? Because I don't think that I could have planned that any better. You know what I'm saying? It just happened. What do you think the hardest aspect of breaking into the entertainment industry? What do you think the hardest shit is about that? The hardest part about this all is that like people don't want to follow somebody who's doing as bad as they're doing. They don't want to, if you're broke and you're on the internet and you're on TV, people don't want to follow that. So there's a certain amount of like, 
image sorcery you have to do a little catfishing to make people think that the money is endless and that you can do anything and you look a certain way because they want to follow somebody who doesn't look like somebody they'd see at their local walmart they want to follow somebody that has more money than the person that they're going to see at the gas station like they want what has been known as the in class as the american dream which means you have a a great family maybe a dog or two you have enough money to like be able to live vacation support yourself and have a few nice cars if you want to. And when people are looking at you and if you're doing a good job at that, then they start to take away your human right. They want you to now be a figment of their imagination. So what I have now realized is that if you make a mistake, you're not really allowed to grow if you're famous. Like they, people want you to just be right always and they want to cancel you at any drop of a dime for doing something that they would do or their friends would do or that they have done 10 times worse than you. But you should not be doing it because you are famous. And for me, being somebody who has made everything and had it hot glued and duct taped my whole career together, it just, <laughs> hey, I'm proud of myself and my team yeah. for yeah. catfishing people enough to believe that I am this <laughs> crazy person I mean, that is so, so unbelievably rich and stuff. I mean, it, it's hard for me to say, just as hard as it was for me to say I'm gay, it's hard for me to say I'm rich because oh, that's you, like- you are, honey. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we neighbors, but we're not neighbors for real. <laughs> okay, I ain't gonna blow you up. <laughs> you so you are. stupid. <laughs> um. Oh, bitch, you are. Okay. <laughs> I'll say it for you. He's rich. <laughs> As fuck. Okay, get your coins together, bitch. You can't run with this one on your best day. <laughs> you have such a well old machine. People like work their whole <laughs> life to do that. How the fuck do you achieve that? And that's a real question, Tajik. How do you <laughs> do that shit? No, for real. Especially black people, because you know, we have the homies working for us. You ain't got no homies. <laughs> no, in the house. That's the thing. And I, I'm talking I, about I, black people. I'm talking about your friends. Your friends. Yeah. No, I got what you're saying. Yeah. Um, people have to respect you, and if you don't run a well-oiled machine, and if you let think little things slide here or there, then it, then they just keep going, and they're like, "Well, I can do that. If that person can do that." So I think it's just like recognizing what professionalism is and and, and leading by example, because I'm professional with them. I show up on time. I do what I say that I'm going to do. But I think you have to like get to a place where you're like, this is what has to be done. And like you said, a machine, when everybody is in place and everybody shows up on time and everybody respects you, so they're not going to show up. If somebody walks into this house one minute late, even one minute late, they already know that I'm crazy bitch. (laughs) And I have a camera that I could see every single room (laughs) in my house. And I know what's going on. And I'm going to be like, wait, but you said you were going to be, you know, like, I think that you just have to hold people accountable and, but do it in a nice way. I used to do it in a mean, bitchy Regina George, Miranda Priestley way. And now I just, I feel like I've now learned that I can accomplish those same things without being rude, but just holding everybody to a certain standard. And also you have to learn how to fire people. You have to learn how to let people go out of your life when they're not meant to go to where you're going to go. Because I used to have my homies with me and then my homies kept that mentality and they stayed mentally even if they were geographically in LA they were mentally in Plainview Texas and wherever they came from and I'm trying to get here I want to be the gay Jay-Z and Beyonce I want to be somebody who's leading by example like Jay-Z and Beyonce aren't just incredible artists they're philanthropists they respect all types of art they're publicists of themselves they make sure that everything that they do is done with a level of class even down to like talking about affairs that they've had is not done. It's not on the shade room. It's done in such a classy artistic way. And that's what I am trying to achieve. And that's why I have this tattoo that says, what would Beyonce do? Because every day when I'm tired and stuff, I look at that and I'm like this, I don't know what she's doing right now, but I imagine that she's working hard every single day. So that's, that's what you, that's what I have to do. And and I've had to learn how to be a good businessman because I didn't start yeah. out that way. And it, it's hard. It's a completely different skill set, And a lot of performers don't have to learn that but I'm glad that I had to do it for myself because now there's not an aspect not a video not a camera not a lens not a location not a deposit not a truck nothing goes into my 
theater or into my life without me knowing everything about yeah. it. And I and, and I like that because I am the, the person that's running the train. And now a lot of people don't know what's happening with their business. They don't even know where their money is. They don't know yeah. where it's going. They don't know if this choreographer they're paying is really worth it in the streets. Yeah. Are you paying for them or their assistant? Like you need yeah. to know. And I think we as Black people specifically need to know like how to run our businesses in every single aspect of that business. And I've also fallen and failed a lot publicly. People have like come for me and I take the things even if they're trying it and over exaggerating and embellishing the truth to try to make me seem like a worse person than I am. I stop. I say, what would Beyonce do? I look at that situation and say, don't address this person. Figure out a way to to take the nuggets of truth that are in this and implement them into your life to be better so this doesn't happen again. All right, when we come back, we're going to really dive into Taj's career and how he successfully created the life he once dreamed of. So stay with us. Get empowered and take control of your love life with the guidance of live phone and online chat readings from Path Forward Psychics. From heartbreak to complicated relationships to single and looking for love, you can receive the answers, clarity, and direction you need from a supportive psychic who understands. Path Forward's intuitive psychics are exceptionally gifted and carefully screened. They guarantee their service, so if you're unhappy with your reading, you'll get your money back. Path Forward readings are completely private, so you can lay it all out there and get an objective opinion about your love life without fear of judgment. Their psychic specialize in all matters of the heart and are available 24-7. I'm so excited about having my first reading with Path Forward Psychics. Like, it's been a long time since I've sat down and had a conversation with anyone for advice besides my therapist. But, you know, when you're under construction, it's always a good thing to build a village to help you get where you need to go. Are you ready to take the next step? Get a love reading for just 75 cents per minute and you'll get three minutes free. Go to PathForwardPsychics.com or call 1-855-850-1800 and mention the promo code TAMAR to get started. That's PathForwardPsychics.com and use promo code TAMAR to redeem this special introductory rate. You must be 18 years or older to have a psychic reading. Here's another podcast that you must listen to right now. Built to Last is a podcast by American Express that highlights the stories, history, and continued legacy of Black-owned small businesses that shape American culture. In honor of Black History Month, American Express is continuing to shine a light on these Black-owned businesses with the release of a special episode highlighting Rose Nico, the first known coffee vendor in New Orleans in the 1800s, and Sip and Sonder, a community and well-being focused coffee shop in Inglewood, California. If you haven't already, check out the debut season of Built to Last and hear host Elaine Weatherall explore how the black business leaders of our past have inspired today's black-owned small businesses. The season features small business owners like Pinky Cole of Atlanta Food Trucks Turn Restaurant, Slutty Vegan, Anifa Muamba, a cutting-edge designer, and so many other amazing small business owners. Plus, there's a special check-in with modern-day Renaissance woman, Issa Rae. As Built to Last uncovers and celebrates past and present stories of Black entrepreneurship in America, we hope to encourage all of our listeners to support these businesses and also the Black-owned businesses in your community. Check out the debut season of Built to Last on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Hey, what's going on? This is Kevin Hart. New episodes of my podcast, Comedy Gold Mines, drop every Thursday. Listen, and most importantly, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Comedy Gold Mines, brought to you by HelloFresh. All right, everybody, we're back into the blueprint to continue our conversation with rapper, singer, songwriter, actor, director, choreographer, and good friend, Todrick Hall. All the hats that you wear, like you were saying, nothing goes past you without you knowing about it. You've been creating like musicals since high school. Now they're sold out all over the world, which I love that about you too. It's one of my favorite <laughs> things about you. And all of these things, like you the director, you the choreographer, um, you do have people working for you, but that, I mean, of course you can't get here by yourself, but he also manages himself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have you ever thought about this being too many hats and I can't do this no more? Oh, yes. All the time. But the thing is, it's like... Really? Yeah. I mean, it, it's so overwhelming. I see other people who show up and like someone on some else I quit their shit? songs. 
I I don't think I would ever quit, but I just think like I would right. love for the right person to come into my life, like a relationship even, you know, like it's kind of like that, but like a, a, a professional relationship, I would love for somebody to come into my life who was qualified and had the credentials to handle someone like me, to get me to the next level where I didn't have to do it by myself. But I'm not willing to settle for somebody that's just going to take a percentage of my money and where I'm teaching them how to do their job. I want somebody who is at the level they need to be to manage me because to manage an artist is a really, really, really difficult thing and everybody can't yes. do it and everybody can't do it well. And so, yeah, but there've been times that I've just been like, Todrick, this is, it's too much. It's a lot. Like it is, it's so much. Like when people come to my concerts, I don't think that they realize that I like wrote every song and every lyric and choreographed every dance. And I got all the costumes and I hired all the dancers myself, every single aspect, not just even what's in the stage, but I'm, I'm behind the scenes. That's why I say it at all my concerts. And some of the critiques that I get online would suggest that other people think that someone else is managing me. I do have a business manager who handles my finances. So she pays everyone. And I, and I love that. And I needed that. But, but as far as managing my career, I do it by myself and it's, and it's hard. And so Sometimes there have definitely been days where I've just been like, I quit. I remember the first time I met Beyonce and I asked her to take a picture and she was really kind, but she said, yes, if you can do it quickly. And I always thought that was so weird that she said that to me. I'm like, Why? of course I could do it quickly. <laughs> because to me at that time, I was a regular person and quickly has a completely different definition when you are a regular person than when you are Beyonce. And now I realize I didn't do it that quickly. My phone was in my back pocket. I didn't have it ready. I went to take the picture. The oh, camera no. was facing the wrong way. Mm -mm. And I'm like, I'm surprised that she stayed there and waited for me to get my shit together because quickly is not 45 seconds or a minute, which that is what no. it was to me. Quickly is now <laughs> and right <Yeah>. now. <laughs> and you see all these people that get these reputations for being a bitch and stuff, but they are in a, a, a situation that um, most humans will never be in and they will never have to handle. And now every time someone asks me for a photo, I will never say no. I will always say yes because yeah. I'm so grateful. I wasn't somebody who was cast in a movie or something and got a bunch of followers because I went to the right audition. I worked my ass off for every single follower and every single view that I have. So if someone comes and says something to me, it's just personal to me because it's a reflection of the work that I've done. So I always say yes, but bitch, <laughs> these bitches be stressing me out, not knowing how to work their own phone when they ask you for a picture. It's so true. So Sometimes you be in a rush and you got shit to do just like they got shit to do. And it's like pumpkin. Yes. Let's take this picture. All right. Okay, girl, let's do it. And then it's take a picture. And can, and can you talk to my aunt? And can you talk to my cousin? And can you talk to No, I don't oh, want to talk to your phone. FaceTime and the voice yeah. memos and stuff. It's just sometimes yeah. it could be a little bit of a lot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, um, but you know what keeps me doing it? And this is a true story. It is a minute for me, but it's everything to them. Mm -hmm. So I... What are the chances of them running into you again or to me again or Beyonce yeah. again? I, I, you know, I've been gifted with a lot of blessings. And, you know, um, if I can give somebody two minutes of my time, okay. I can say firsthand how sweet you were to me. I don't know that if the tables were turned and I didn't know, because you didn't know me when I met you, you were just so unbelievably sweet to me. And I, I appreciate that. And you're right. It lasted a lifetime for me. I will forever be a fan and a supporter of yours because you treated me like, not only were you just nice to me, you treated me like we had been friends for 45 years. Like, and <laughs> it was just, I couldn't believe it. You're one of the nicest people. That is also something I, I know people, I get canceled online for, you know, like, <laughs> being Taylor's best friend, but uh, yeah, because you know I was getting ready to go there. Oh, girl, well, let's go there. Yeah, I was going to go there. Do you feel like people give you shit for being best friends with Taylor Swift? Yes. Why? I do not know. Me either. I have no idea. I don't know what it is. I really don't know. Like I've asked some people, but here's the thing. I don't really care because right. my mission is to create a place where my children are going to be able to grow up in a world where they can get along with everybody. Right. And I think a lot of people sometimes forget that message. I think that a lot of people have been hurt by white people or people who might look like Taylor Swift because they're blonde haired and blue eyed. But I think that Taylor Swift is low hanging fruit that people just try to like make her be the, the, the villain or whatever in a lot of ways or not the villain, but what Taylor represents to a lot of people is privilege and stuff. Privilege and she, I think, 
Yeah. And I think yeah. she, she's a very self-aware human and she acknowledges yeah. that, but I'm going to tell you this, and, and this is my, how I honestly feel about it. Cause you know me, you've hung out with me and you've never met somebody with me that you didn't, that you didn't think was cool and was a nice person. X. When I have needed somebody to be there for me in my corner, Taylor has been there for me. Her parents have always been so sweet to me and treated me as if I was their own. They have let my cousins, my family members, my friends come and hang out backstage in her dressing room while she's getting ready. She's been there for me in situations and we've had uncomfortable conversations. And and, and I've talked to her about things that I never thought I would be able to talk to a white person about. And she sat down and she listened. and, And I think that she... Every day, like, does so much work to be a, a better person and a better ally to the LGBTQ plus community. I also just feel like the way she takes care of her staff and her team, which is a lot of people that are very diverse, like Taylor hires a lot of African American performers, uh, a lot of African American singers. She works with them and. I don't know if a lot of people know this, and maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but when when she's not working. And on tour for two years, whatever, she pays all of her people to be, to just wait for her to, to say, I value you, that I want to make sure that you are taken care of yeah. until the next time I need you to come and sing with me because now this is not just a gig and you're not just here to support me. We are family. She shows up to their weddings. She, oh, wow. when, when one of her dancers got cancer, she saw it on social media. She paid for all of that kid's bills. She has bought people homes like that are that are I mean, the stuff that she does, like I I it's not my place to say, but I right, know right. that she will just on a regular day just go to a hospital and go spend her whole day working with kids that have cancer and stuff and will specifically tell them not to post about it on social media because it's not about that for her. She realizes what she can do for so many people. Just the person that I have seen her be, I just respect her so much. And there is no way that I'm ever going to, when you meet her, if these people that are talking shit about her ever met her, they'd be like, oh, wow. Like, you know, how you feel about Gaga. Like whenever you talk about her, I've never met her, but the way you talk about her, I'm just like, she has to be so cool because I know that Tamar is not the type of person that would be blowing smoke for Lady Gaga if she wasn't everything that Tamar says she is, you know? Okay, um, Tajik. So tell me about your new project. The third part of the trilogy that is House Party is coming out called House Party 3. The other ones are a little, little rocky, kiki, tie, work, big, yes. yes, twirl the house down boots. Love it. it. Um, but this album is like a very um, different vibe for me. It's all love songs. All Is it? And it's not... Yeah, it is. And then I'm not like, like R and B, like ribs and barbecue love songs. Some a little bit. I mean, there's it's it's not like a lot of it is kind of like emo, like it, as if Billie Eilish, you know, and I had like a little collaboration, like not I don't know how to explain it really, because I wrote all these songs at different chapters of my life. And when I was going through different things, and there's been times that I loved some, I have a song called Dysfunctional that I love. And I was like embarrassed to put this song out because there was somebody who did me so dirty, but I still love them and I still wanted to be with them. And even though Puh. I knew that it was dysfunctional. <laughs> Sometimes it be like that. You know? Maybe. A- oh, I can't wait to hear. <sighs> it's very like, chill relax there's four notes in it it's not it's not a um it's just how i was feeling in the moment when i was like why do i keep thinking about this motherfucker who has done me wrong several times and but i still feel like they love me and i feel like if we could just figure this out we we would be the greatest like and nobody else That's how even we is. yeah that's it why is this just so simple it's you know yeah. Now run that by me again. Now what what is it? What would you like to do? What happened? The, your words, not mine. What happened? I don't even remember what I just said, bitch, You but said that we could just we could figure just it work, out. Figure it yeah. out. Cause the love is still there. Come on. And it don't matter in this situation. I don't care how many people knew that we didn't work out because sometimes we let our ego get involved and it's embarrassing oh. for us. I- To even acknowledge the fact that we still love this person and we still think about them every day and everybody else in comparison ain't shit, even though they wasn't shit to me in that moment, but I still love they ass. And that's, (laughs) and let the church say amen. 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 (laughs) Okay. 
Is there anything you want to talk about before we close? That's it. Honestly, that's oh. that's it. I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I can do to change my um, relationship with the Black gay community because I love being Black and I love being gay. And the, like, and I, if anybody who knows me knows that like, I think my white friends come here and feel attacked by me explaining to them their privilege and stuff. But I'm a type of person that like, I have friends from Texas who are Trump supporters, but I will take the time to talk to them about the reasons why like them supporting Trump is problematic in my opinion, you know? And so for me, I don't think that it does us any good to huddle up with our team and talk about how much we hate the other team and just be like, okay, we good. We're in the same like page. My strategy to make the world a better place is like, we got to go to the other side and shake hands and hug people, even people who have burned us, even if sometimes they're not doing the work to get there first. Like that's not everybody's strategy, but that's my strategy. Like I want to be cool with everybody. And you come to my house and it is the epitome of diversity. We got black people, white people, Asian people, gay people, drag queens, transgender people. And that, and that is when I feel the most beautiful because I feel like I'm bringing people together. And like, I will never apologize for that, but I want to work on my relationship with the black community because I feel like sometimes they feel because I've dated white people in the past stuff that it's just a really hard thing. Like when you become successful, a lot of times, and I understand this, but they put me in these like little montages with Billy Porter and RuPaul and Karamo and like all these black successful people who are dating white men, um, which I'm not dating a white man mm-hmm. right now, but um, it just... I understand the frustration and why they're so mad and why it must feel like so defeating for people to become successful in the black community and then not still support their own and their eyes. Um, I get that. And I think I'm just like trying to work on my relationship with that because during this quarantine, I've been going to therapy. And I think my, my truth is like, I have never really felt super comfortable around my own people. When I go to the mall and stuff, like the people who would say things that would make me uncomfortable would always be black men. When I went to the barbershop, I would feel so uncomfortable around black men. Um, It's black straight men specifically. And I think even now I won't go to a barbershop. Like I will pay someone extra money to come here because I just don't like that energy. And it, it, immediately, no matter how confident I am, makes me go back to that old Todrick that was there. So I love having conversations about this and I'm, I've been trying to make friends with people who have gone online and drugged the fuck out of me <laughs> on the internet, but I have made friends with them so that I can grow because I love my people and I just want yeah. to just like keep doing the work because my experience just hasn't been a lot of people's experience. The reality is I've been raised around a lot of white people There's not a lot of black people doing ballet. There's not a lot of black people yeah. in theaters, not a lot of black people working at Disney World and the places that I that I was at. And so I appreciate people like you being in my life just to like give me perspective and stuff. Cause you know, that's not something that you go through, right? People never come for you for not being black enough or no, they do not people. People used to come, um, come for me for like always being around gay boys, (laughs) which really what? (laughs) Absolutely. They had a, they had a problem with it. They had a damn problem with it. You know what I'm saying? Like she always with the gay boys. Well, this is my philosophy. And I don't know, maybe because of, you know, all this extensive therapy that I've been through. And I was going to give share a word with you. Do you think maybe why your relationship with with black, with the black LGBTQ community is so strange? It's a a mouthful. (laughs) Yeah, because you never really had that acceptance growing up from a male black person. I think it's a combination of both. I think it's a combination of both, but I think it's also because like, I haven't been public about like black people that I've dated, but if somebody's not like a serious boyfriend, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna right. post them. But I think that because I have posted white guys that I've dated because we got to a level, I felt like it was, you know, you met Jesse, my ex, and um, we had been dating for two and a half years. So I posted pictures of him, but I haven't been with anybody that I felt close enough with to share that side of my life with. And being in a, you know this, more than anybody, bitch, I know that being in a public relationship, it's already hard enough for people to go through a breakup. But when you go through a breakup publicly, you feel like you have to break up with that person for them and in front of your fans. That's just too much. And after I went through that the last time, I was like, I don't want to do this shit again. So if you if I'm going to come public about you, it's got to be the real thing. And when I date black men, they be playing the ones that I've dated. I, this is not a blanket statement. 
But they be playing games in the streets. <laughs> they be playing games on me, tilting their phone to the side and shit. I'm like, who are you texting? And why you have to tilt your phone over there when you texted this person, bitch? I saw it and I want to know what the hell's going on. Like, I just don't, I'm crazy a little bit. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't. But you like who you like. You know what I'm saying? And fuck who don't care. Fuck who don't like you because you like who you like, when you like. Black, yeah. white, Puerto Rican, yellow, Asian. It don't matter. You know what I mean? We have to stop apologizing for going after what we want and not getting the public's opinion. I'm sorry. I can't do that no more. Just like I can't show well, y'all my man no more. Yeah, yeah, man. Okay. That's that <laughs> on that. Okay, so I'm not going to hold you any longer, but I do want to get your takeaway from this interview. The takeaway is usually what you've learned or what you enjoyed the most out of what we talked about. I think I just enjoy, like, I mean, you said you were nervous at the beginning. Like, for me to talk to you feels like I'm just on FaceTime with my homegirl, and I love that, and I love that it feels like a safe space. And I just love that you are the type of person that just, like, is unapologetic about whatever you say. You have gotten some beat downs on the internet in the next day I'm like oh she ain't had enough she re- still posted shit like I'll be like <laughs> she don't give up you don't care and I love yeah. that and I wish that I had that energy and I just love you and I love being able to talk to somebody who is also black because most of the, the podcasts or interviews I do are with people who don't have the same background as me and so it is sometimes <laughs> um, a little bit difficult for them to understand where I might yeah. be coming from and so yeah. even though I know our stories are not exactly similar we still have a lot of similarities and I also just know it's all love with you so I think that's the thing I took away from it I just felt really safe I think for me I think my biggest takeaway is knowing that you're unstoppable and it doesn't matter the opinions of everybody it doesn't stop you it pushes you further and in this canceling what do they call it culture or whatever the fuck whack shit it is (laughs) (laughs) That, that gives a person the right to tell you online that you don't matter anymore. You still matter, you know, and I admire that about you. And not just that, but you want to grow and learn, like you becoming friends or reaching out to the people who are in your comments acting a fool and saying crazy, ridiculous things. That is a part of growing. Let me know what I did wrong. What is it that you didn't like? Help me understand so I can glow and grow. And that is what being under construction is all about. So thank you so much. Like uh, that, I ain't going to so reach much. out to nobody. I ain't going to be like you now. I ain't reaching out to y'all in my comments. So say that bullshit. <laughs> 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 That's Todrick. <laughs> but I, it's admirable. <laughs> and I appreciate it. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. Well, I love you. Thanks for having me. Whew, this has been such an inspiring conversation. I know a lot of people think that once you reach a certain level of success, you can just stop feeding yourself affirmations and fueling your soul with inspiring messages. But, y'all, that's not true. It's so important to keep the positivity flowing in your life. So, y'all, this has truly been fun and super uplifting to my soul. Well, That's our show, ladies and gentlemen. And now that the show has come to a close, I want you to think of the challenges that are keeping you from being a self-made millionaire. I feel like Tajik kept it all the way a thou thou with us, right? He sure did. And his journey was not easy. So get out there, y'all, and make your dreams your reality. Yes, I know you can do it. So if you would like to share your under construction journey with me, all you have to do is shoot me an email to ucwithtamar at gmail.com. That's the letters ucwithtamar at gmail.com. And look, if no one else tells you, remember, I love you. And I mean it. Because we are all under construction together. Bye. Under Construction is a production of Most Sauce, a Stitcher brand. It's produced by Angel Lavis. Our recording engineer and sound designer is Rashad Smith. Our executive producer is T-Square. Music provided by Radio, an audio everywhere company. More sauce.